We've done several tours in the past weeks and months. If you've missed them, please go to my website, which is girltraveltours.com slash virtual dash tours. You can see all of our past tours and you can go on the recordings. I also have a YouTube channel. If you search Girl Travel Tours um, virtual tours, you'll find us there as well. And we have several tours coming up in the weeks to come. I'm gonna share a list of these so that you can see them. So um, it may help. Sometimes I, I'm a visual learner. So to see, the, to see the list is a little bit better than just to hear it. But we're going to Vienna, Berlin, the Canadian Rockies, um, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Florence and Tuscany. We're doing a World War II in the Western Front, Scandinavia, Notable Women of Santa Fe, Mystery on the Orient Express, Northern Ireland and its Troubles, Iceland, and so much more. As long as you're interested in viewing these tours, we will continue to produce the presentations for you with my tour directors from all over the world. You can register for future tours and view past tours at my website. Again, I'm gonna give you that girltraveltours.com slash virtual hyphen tours. I believe that's on the slide that you're seeing right now so that you can see that address. Um, let's see, today for the first time, uh, but not the last, we are visiting a place in my own country, America, specifically Alaska. I'm very excited to share that with you. But before we get going, I want to share with you a few ways that you can interact with us during the presentation tonight. One is the chat mechanism. If you want to chat me something or if you want to get an answer for something, you can chat. Um, if you want Bob, our tour director, to respond to a question, please put that in the Q&A tab. And the people that are live on Facebook, you can put those in the comments and I'll do my best to read from both. Um, the Q&A in Zoom, as well as the Facebook comments. And the other way that I always like to interact with people before is I like to launch a poll. And tonight's poll just gives us an understanding of what your connection is with Alaska. So the people on Zoom, feel free to um, put in your answers. And the answers are, I've been and I love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I've never been, but I'm thinking about it. And I'm interested in experience it, experiencing it virtually. My own answer tonight would be, I have a trip booked. I actually have a trip booked with Bob and the Go Ahead group for 2022. If anybody out there is interested in joining us in the summer of 2022, feel free to message me and you can jump on our group. We're gonna have a great time. So it looks like we have about 75% of the people who've answered. And I'm gonna share the results with you. It looks like most of our people have never been, but are thinking about visiting. So that's about 35%. And then we have about 25% that have been and loved it or that are planning it in the future. So those results you can see on your screen now. Again, the most of the people are thinking about it in the future, but there's, there's a pretty decent amount of people who've been and are planning it in the future. Okay. So I'm gonna get that off the screen for you all so that we can continue. Before we hand over the tour to the tour director, I just want to um, say that I know a lot of you have joined us on Facebook and I appreciate that. I, I do wanna warn you out there that there are a lot of people that are scamming um, and copycatting these legitimate virtual events and pages. And I just wanna warn you all to never, ever, ever give your credit card to sign into a free virtual event. Our events are free to attend. And um, these, these people out there are trying to get your credit card information. And I just wanna warn you and make sure that you, know, you, you don't click on any links in the comments for attending tours and you don't hopefully go to the copycats out there. Um, but feel free to stay on my website, which is girltraveltours.com for some safe, legitimate, and good virtual tour presentations. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'm gonna talk about our tour director. A tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge manages all your travel plans and makes sure that your experience is stressless and full of great experiences, allowing you to make lifelong memories 
and to have it as a stress-free vacation. These are by far the most important people in your group. They're educated, they're fun, and they love their jobs. If we're not traveling, our tour directors have no work. So I'll share during the presentation in the chat and during the Q&A, if you were so inclined to tip the tour director, um, I'll give you the means in which to do that. And all the tour, I will say that all of the tips that are collected minus the Zoom expenses do go to the tour directors. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only reignite our desire to travel, but allow a tour director to do what he does best and share his knowledge and passion for travel. So back to our virtual tour tonight. Today, we are lucky to have a tour director who loves the state of Alaska and visits it each and every year with groups of travelers. I'm honored to introduce you to and hand over this event to our amazing tour director for this evening, Bob Brown. So Bob, if you don't mind, I'm gonna set up the slides while you welcome everybody and then we can take it over from here. Very good. Well, welcome everybody. It's a really a pleasure to be with you tonight. It has been so much fun putting this together. I have truly missed Alaska this year. Uh, first time in several years that I have not had an opportunity to go up there. I'm a tour director with Go Ahead Tours. Uh, I've been leading tours for uh, about 15 years with their sister company, EF Explore America, and with Go Ahead for probably you know over a dozen tours. I've been doing Alaska for at about 10 years. Now, I was not born in Alaska, and I have never lived in Alaska, but again, I've been leading tours there for, you know, the past 10 years, and uh, it's just my pleasure tonight to share with you, you know, some of my favorite places and some of my favorite things to do. So, welcome to Alaska. Alaska is a big, big estate, and, um, you know, it is quite spectacular. Uh, and all the different colors you see on the map, you can actually see those colors at different times of the year. We're not, we'll see a couple of those colors tonight, but it is spectacular. Over 660,000 square miles. Now, sometimes that's hard to imagine, but if you took Alaska and divided it in two, Texas would become the third largest state. Hmm. So where does my state fit in? I've been looking at some of the folks who have been, uh, you know, checking in where they're coming from. As some folks from Florida, it would take 10 Floridas to make one Alaska. It would take 13 Pennsylvanias to make an Alaska, 277 Delawares to make an Alaska. And I know the thing it's all in the back of your mind. How about Rhode Island? Just 477 Rhode Islands to make uh, you know, just one Alaska. Alaska is big, uh, 1,420 miles wide. That's like going from Atlantic City, New Jersey to Salt Lake City. And, uh, and lengthwise, it's 20 over 2,200 miles long. And uh, that's like going from Boston to West Palm Beach, Florida. It is big, a uh, great state to see. And around every corner, there is something beautiful. You know, I tell my people, you know, when I'm on tour, I said, you will go around the corner and you will see something. You'll say, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And a short while later, you'll be looking at, you'll be going around another corner. And again, you'll be saying to yourself, well, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So if you're ready, let's go on tour. But you know, like with all tours, you know, I must let you know there are some safety um, instructions that I might give out. And I'm fortunate to have a, a native Alaskan, you know, who has volunteered that, you know, her time uh, to help us, you know, with our presentation tonight and the safety portion of our program. Uh, most of these photographs are photographs that I have taken on tour. I take my camera every single time. I never get tired of seeing Alaska because I'm always seeing something new. And, uh, you know, I am a technological dinosaur. And, you know, fortunately, Mara was able to take my pictures and put together this wonderful slide presentation, which I hope you will enjoy. So we should have a big picture of Alaska. We're ready for our safety instructor. Okay, Bob, I think we're good to go. Okay, let's go to the next screen. Now, during the course of our tour, you know, we'll be crossing some busy streets. And as you can see, uh, Millie, the moose, she is demonstrating the proper way of crossing the street, you know, in the crosswalks, as opposed to her cousin, Molly. And there's Molly getting ready to cross the street again. Now, your tour of Alaska actually starts long before you hit the ground. You'll have a long flight no matter where you're coming from. And, uh, 
you know, your tour actually starts when you're way up in the air, about an hour outside of Anchorage. Most of you will be flying into Anchorage. You know, roll up those windows a little bit and look outside. You will see some unbelievable, spectacular sights. Uh, glaciers. Alaska has over 100,000 glaciers, most of which are unnamed. They're just in this vast wilderness. And looking out the window from the airplane, you get these just unbelievable sights. You know, we're starting in, you know, you will land probably in Anchorage, the largest city in, in all of Alaska. And, and, you know, it looks like a big modern city. And it is a big modern city. It's not that very old city. Uh, even by Alaska standards, a little bit over 100 years ago. Um, 1911, there were only four people living in Anchorage. They lived down by, you know, one of the creeks. And then slowly when the railroad, you know, became a big thing, the Alaska Railroad, you know, that's when Alaska took off. Today, the population of Alaska is about 700,000. And the population of Anchorage is about 300,000. So you can see that about 40% of the population of, Anch of Alaska lives in Anchorage, and then many, many more live nearby. A lot of small villages. Anchorage is uniquely situated uh, on the top of the globe, so to speak. It's a huge airport and one of the busiest uh, commercial airports, you know, in the world because it's equidistant from Tokyo uh, to Anchorage and Anchorage to New York. So you have so many you know, cargo planes coming in and out. They call themselves the air crossroads of the world. Uh, Anchorage is really a neat spot to visit. You know, some neat things to do there. If you get in early, um, you know, get yourself a, a hotel downtown because there's some nice places you can walk to and some things that you can sample uh, along the way, which are truly uniquely Alaska type things. And this is one of my favorite. Now, the building behind us is the Alaska Lands Man or Management Building. It's operated by the National Park Service. Uh, it's an old you know, post office built during the Roosevelt administration. But inside, they have a, a nice museum and some excellent videos. But my favorite spot is right out front, where you will see one of the many carts which sell reindeer sausage. Truly something which is unique to Alaska. And Anchorage is a great place to, to sample one. And you can have it your way. You can have it with a little mustard and ketchup and onion, as this one does, or some of the vendors will have sauerkraut, other things. It is good. A little bit stronger meat, but, you know, really a, a tasty treat. Highly recommend that. Our tour, basically, today, we're going to be going on land a little bit in a bus, and we're going to ride a train, make our way back down. We'll get on a cruise ship, and then we're going to have some beautiful, beautiful cruising. As we leave, as we leave Anchorage, we're going to travel a little further north. In about 30 minutes, we will leave the greater Anchorage area and we'll be in what's known as the Matsu Valley, the Matanushka Susitna Valley. You may have heard about, you know, how big plants grow up there. Now, these cabbage look big, but these are actually pretty tiny. The Matsu Valley is where the huge vegetables are grown. Um, many years ago, it was discovered that the land there was so fertile because of the volcanic soil which had built up and uh, which was a great place to grow. And also because of the tremendous amount of sunlight which they get during the, the summer months, you know, here in the Matsu Valley, they get about 19 hours of sun, you know, every day in June. And so the plants have tremendous growing seasons. In the Matsu Valley, they have a, the Alaska World's Fair, is, or the Alaska Fair, I should say, is held each year, usually the last part of August, in Palmer, Alaska, which is in the Matsu Valley. And that is when the, uh, the farmers bring in their prized products. Now, here we have a cabbage. This is actually a tiny cabbage, uh, although it's pretty good size. Uh, the cabbage that you buy in a grocery store is usually three to four pounds. The record cabbage that came into the fair a couple years ago, 138.25 pounds. That's a lot of cabbage. And it has to be coleslaw quality. You know, it cannot have wilted leaves. They have to be peeled off. It has to be beautiful, just like the image you see before that. Now, usually the big thing is the cabbage contest, but every once in a while, somebody will sneak in another you know, big Alaska record. 
And a couple of years ago, Dale Marshall, sort of the Babe Ruth of pumpkin growing, brought in a pumpkin which weighed four, uh, 1,471 and a half pounds. That's a big pumpkin. So you're saying to yourself, that's a lot of pumpkin pies. Yes, it is. That would make 981 eight inch pumpkin pies or one 654 foot pie, which I'm pretty sure you can buy at Costco, but only in a two pack. They can grow them real big up there. Now, as we ride through the Matsu Valley, you know, it's a beautiful ride going through some areas. And then all of a sudden, as we're approaching a town called Talkeetna, you know, out of the front of your vehicle, you will see a spectacular, you know, scene. Uh, on a nice clear day, uh, you will see the wonderful Denali, the tallest mountain in North America at 20,310 feet. Truly magnificent. And we are still quite a distance away. Uh, Denali is a twin peak mountain. We are looking at the South Peak, which is the taller peak at uh, you know, 20,310, but it is absolutely beautiful. And as you know, we zoom in a little bit more, you get to just see you know, just how spectacular Denali is. And Denali is um, very shy. Only about 30% of the people that go to Alaska get to see Denali. She's usually hiding somewhere. But when you see her, it is a sight that you will never forget. A beautiful mountain, part of the Alaska range. There are many different uh, mountain ranges in Alaska, but uh, Denali is in the Alaska range and makes up and is the tallest mountain there. Now, Denali, as you can see Denali on your right, uh, to the far left, you'll see Mount Four Acre. Uh, the, you know, Athabascan name, well, the Athabascan name, Denali's an Athabascan name. The Athabascan are the native uh, Alaskan people that lived in this particular region. Uh, they named the mountain Denali, which translates into the tall one or the great one. Uh, the mountain to the far left is Menlale, which translates into Denali's wife. Uh, that has been since called Mount Fouracre at, uh, I believe it's 17,400. And then in the middle, of course, you have Denali and Denali's wife. What could be in the middle? But Denali's child, and that's Beguya, which is Athabascan for Denali's child. Uh, truly a spectacular scene when you can see that. We are right outside you know, the town of uh, Talkeetna. Welcome to beautiful Talkeetna. Talkeetna is a neat little place to visit. You may remember a few years back, well, more than a few years back, 20 some years back, there was a television program called Northern Exposure about this quirky little village, you know, in Alaska. And it was loosely modeled after the town of Talkeetna. And uh, Talkeetna is still a quirky little place today. It started as a railroad stop. Uh, it's halfway between, you know, Seward and Fairbanks when they were building the Alaska Railroad. And this little town, you know, sprung up there. Uh, here you have on the left-hand side, Nagley Store, been there since 1921. Always a nice place to visit in there. Uh, the other historic building is, uh, you know, just almost across the street, the Fairview Inn. And there are, I wouldn't call it the Fairview Inn, I would say it's the Great View Inn because there's some beautiful, beautiful views there. But the Fairview opened in 1923. President Warren Harding, you know, who drove the Golden Spike, you know, when the Alaska Rail was completed, you know, on his way back, you know, south, you know, he stopped and spent the night in, in Fairview Inn. Uh, it is still there. Uh, there are some rooms there, but, you know, the bar downstairs is the attraction which draws most people. Uh, Talkeetna is a neat place. For many years, they had the moose dropping festival there. Uh, what's moose droppings? Well, you know, that's what a moose lose, leaves behind. But uh, the folks there, again, you know, just having fun with things, they would gather them, they would varnish them, sometimes they would paint them. And uh, then they would have a contest of you know, either trying to toss them into a circle, drop them from a ladder. It got so big, they were actually bringing in a boom truck and dropping it from a boom truck to see who could land it closest to the center of the bullseye. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have it any longer, but it was a huge attraction for many, many years, you know, in, in Talkeetna. In Talkeetna, we are going to board our train. Uh, we have been, oh, before we leave Talkeetna, sorry about that. One of my favorite places to visit is the Walter Harper a ranger station. If you're going to climb Denali, and you might want to think twice about this, uh, if you are though, like a thousand people do each and every year, 
You'll first be required to go to the Walter Harper uh, Ranger Station here for an orientation program, whether this is your first time climbing or you've climbed a hundred times, because this is a very unique mountain. It draws climbers from all over the world. They come here, but Denali is very unique because of the crevices, because of the chances of, of avalanches and other things. So it requires, you know, the orientation. From here, many, most climbers will then take a plane, you know, to a base camp, you know, at, you know, on Denali and then ascend from there. Uh, this is Walter Harper. Uh, Walter Harper was a 20 year old Athabascan man. And he was part of an expedition, which was climbing Denali. Uh, they got near the top and uh, Walter was the first person to set foot on the summit, you know, at, at Denali. And uh, that is the young, you know, Walter Harper at about age 20. And he, again, was one of the guides. He was not the lead guy, but he was one of the guides. In Talkeetna, one of the few, you know, railroad stations on the Alaska line going north. Uh, and this is where we'll jump on our train. Alaska Railroad got its start. Oh, in about 1915, they started building it from Seward up and also from Fairbanks down. Most of it was going from Seward up. And, um, you know, that rail still exists today. One of the reasons was in the Matsu Valley, not only is it great for growing, growing vegetables, they also discovered there was huge coal deposits, very, very rich coal, highly desired for fueling um, our great fleet of battleships and other things back in that time period. You know, it's a, a um, you know, the Alaskan Rail is really beautiful. About 10 minutes outside of Talkeetna. Uh, and I have been on the rail for several years. Usually it's a little bit overcast, but, you know, a few years back I was, you know, riding and about 10 minutes out, I looked out the window to the left and there was the spectacular Denali once again. This is one of my favorite views of Denali. And, uh, yeah, there it is just a little bit further. This is the Susitna River. Uh, Susitna is an Athabascan word. It means, uh, some people say dirty river, but I think it means more cloudy uh, water. It's, you know, glacial runoff. If you look at it, it kind of usually has a grayish, uh, greenish color. If you scooped it up in a glass and let it set for about 10 minutes or so, all the, the silt, the glacier silt was settled in the bottom and you see this beautiful, you know, crystal clear water. Um, but that's where Susitna gets its name. But again, the beautiful not Denali in the distance. Our train ride uh, today and whenever you're on it, it will usually take about four hours. You're only going 121 miles. And that seems like an awful long you know, ride, uh, awful long time just to go 121 miles. We can zip along today. But as you can see, sometimes you see the front of the train from the back of the train. Uh, a lot of slow curves to go around back and forth. Uh, one of the you know, views you do not want to miss is when you go over Hurricane Gulch. Uh, you are almost 300 feet, 296 feet above uh, the bottom down below. And then looking out the far side, you, know, you look down on the, the Susitna River. Uh, really beautiful. The, the, the bridge itself is almost 1,000 feet long, about 954 uh, feet, something like that. But looking down at the Susitna, again, the water looks kind of brownish, but if, again, if you scooped it up, the silt would settle out and it would be nice and clear. Just beautiful. Uh, you know, one of the spectacular, the many, many spectacular views, you know, on the train ride up, a little bit closer view. Um, again, around each turn, you see something different. Sometimes you're in uh, the trees that you see in the foreground, they're probably black spruce. They look like the Charlie Brown Christmas trees, but you know, they make a beautiful forest. And then, you know, I've only seen this once, but uh, the beautiful view of Denali from the train, you know, just uh, up in that general area up there. And you see both peaks, the South Peak at 20,310, and then the North Peak at, um, oh, I think it's 19,000 and something like that. But, you know, truly beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And to be able to see those. Once we get up to Denali, we will get off our train and uh, then we actually go out into the Denali National Park. Up in the upper, towards the upper right hand side, you'll see in red the Nanana Canyon Park entrance. And that's where you go into the park. Uh, you can only go in to the park so far in a private vehicle. To go beyond that, you have to be in one of the 
park buses. Uh, they have a particular vendor who delivers these tours and they do a fantastic job. Uh, what you're going to see, you know, it changes every single time, you know, depending on the time of year, uh, depending on the time of day, uh, which animals are out and which are not. You'll go about 60 miles, you know, into the park. Uh, again, beautiful views. And, you know, who knows what you're going to see. That's one of the exciting things about going to Alaska. And you know, my friends ask me, well, don't you get tired going up there, you know, year in, year out, a couple times a year? And I say, no way. Uh, this is the Toklat River. It's what's called a braided river. And you can see there's some sandbars you know, in the river, the Toklat never looks, or in the other braided rivers, never look the same twice. The current coming down is pretty, you know, pretty strong, doesn't look it, but it's pretty strong. And it carves out these different pathways for the water to flow. Uh, really unique, really beautiful. One of my favorite places is you climb up a pass and you get the polychrome pass, polychrome meaning many colors. And you look out in the distance and you see the oranges, the yellows, um, you know, the blacks, the browns, the greens, you know, from the different mineral contents which make up the mountain. You know, truly a breathtaking view. Uh, you know, one of my favorite spots, you know, in the park. Really, really neat to see and neat to visit. You know, throughout Alaska, you'll see, you know, these beautiful pink flowers. Uh, they're called fireweed. Uh, they get their name because after a fire, they are one of the first forms of vegetation which will appear you know, in an area which is burned out. And they're quite pretty, as you can see. They bloom and they're also quite unique. They bloom from the bottom up. And then when they bloom out, they bloom up or bloom out from the bottom up. And uh, the rhyme up there is when the fireweed blooms out, you know, winter is soon about. And usually they say six weeks after, you know, the, uh, the fireweed goes is when you'll have your first your first snow. The state bird of Alaska is the willow ptarmigan. Uh, the P is silent, willow ptarmigan. They're beautiful. And you know, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. This is a male. And if you'll notice on the bottom, you'll see he has his white leggings on and a little white breast. As you get towards closer to winter, and then by the time it's in winter, he will be totally white. You know, here you see a proud papa. His wife was on the far left and in the middle is, I'm not sure if it's their son or their daughter, but they're out for a little walk on this day when we were visiting the park. Uh, but that is the state bird, you know, of Alaska. Now, you know, every time I've been up there, every time I've taken this tour, you know, sometimes you see animals you've never seen before, and sometimes you think you've seen a lot of, but you'll see these little watt dots, dots on a hillside, and you'll think, oh, that's a rock, and then the rock will move a little bit, and then Occasionally, they'll get a little bit closer and they are doll sheep, D-A-H-L sheep, doll sheep. And they are very unique up in this area. They were almost hunted to extinction. And then, um, you know, they now, you know, are protected up there. The doll sheep are able to go way up into the mountains. In the summertime, they are way up high above the other animals uh, for their safety. Their feet have developed so that they are able to walk on those very steep mountains and the bears and the wolves, you know, just can't get to them. Uh, the other thing that we always look for up there is the moose. This is a male moose. Moose are huge. It is the largest, you know, in the, I'm not sure they call it the deer family or the elk family, but these are the big boys. Uh, they have antlers. They do not have horns. They have antlers and they shed those antlers and regrow antlers each year. And, you know, as a, a moose, matures the, the rack, the, uh, the antlers get larger and larger. Uh, kind of shy, depending on the time of season, your best time to see a male is usually going to be, you know, in the fall when they're gathering for what's called the rut, when they're competing for the attention of the female. And here we have a lady, uh, it is fall up there. You can see some of the colors are changing, but the female is just a little bit smaller. Uh, they are usually a little bit easier to spot, especially in the springtime. Uh, they give birth to their calves, you know, in the spring and stay with the calves. Uh, you have mama on the right, you have the calf on the left. You can see the babies grow up pretty quick, but uh, mamas, you know, stay pretty close to the calves. Uh, the fiercest animal in Alaska is the mama moose. Uh, extremely protective. She will stomp you and stomp the other animals. You know, some animals, wolves, 
and uh, maybe occasional grizzly. Might try to take out a young moose, but usually mom is there and a couple kicks, you know, will quickly end the attack. You know, quite an impressive, uh, you know, animal, the largest, you know, of their form up there in Alaska. Uh, their cousin is the caribou. Uh, you know, they are quite popular up there. There's several different herds. Sometimes they're hiding, you know, in little areas amongst the shrubs. Most of these are willow trees, uh, which they, they feed on the moose, you know, love the willow. You know, they'll be over there munching and going on. You know, other times they just pop up, you know, in other places, you know, wanting to know what you're doing on their road and they will stare you down. And uh, sometimes they just stand there. And then sometimes they strike these beautiful poses and uh, you know, the postcard type poses. Uh, caribou, you know, here's another caribou that didn't fare so well. Uh, there's the good caribou. And there's a caribou that didn't fare so well. Uh, there are several packs of wolves, you know, in Denali. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. I've been to Denali a lot in 10 years. This is the only wolf I've seen, but wow, what a sighting. Uh, this is a caribou, which was taken down by the pack the day before, and we came upon it uh, the next day. We don't know if this was a sentry wolf, which was guarding the carcass for the pack, or whether this was the Omega wolf, which was the last one to eat. But, you know, if you look at his eyes, very intense, he was looking at me like, don't you even think about coming down here and joining me for ribs tonight, because it ain't gonna happen. Really impressive animals, and they do pretty well up there. Uh, they hunt, they hunt in packs, and they do pretty well. The other animal that we love to see up there are the grizzly bears. Sometimes they're way on the sides of the hills. Again, they, sometimes they look like rocks and you're glad when that rock moves and you're able to get a little closer look. You know, sometimes they're down alongside one of the, the, rip, the, you know, the river banks scrounging around. You know, this time of year in the summer when we do our tours up there, bears have two things on their mind, eating and where can I find more food? And so that's what they are focused on. Um, always fun to see. Now, sometimes, you know, they do get rather close. This one has saw the door on the bus is open and he's thinking, why should I be walking around here? I can just jump on this bus and, uh, you know, go to my next spot. And they just wander on. And you can see this bear actually got fairly close. This is a shot from inside the bus. And at this point, you know, although you're supposed to be very quiet, you know, when you're viewing animals, I believe the whole bus was saying, driver, please close the door. Uh, and Mr. Bear or Mrs. Bear, you know, got pretty close that day. She's, we'll call her she. Uh, there is a type of vegetation which blooms in, I believe this is late July, which is like cotton candy to these bears. And they are just constantly eating it and going for it. Uh, just loving it. Uh, you've heard about the three bears. Here, here are three bears. You don't want to mess with them. That's a mama and two cubs behind her. Um, it's quite often for them to have two cubs. The cubs will usually stay with them for a couple of years. When they're born, they're only about a pound. They're born, born during the winter when mama's asleep. And then she, again, takes care of them for a couple months. And then, you know, I think some of these bears, you know, have, you know, been watching so much Disney. Uh, the bear that was just feeding on the cotton candy, you know, just roll over on its back. And uh, look at the claws, you know, on that bear. They are three to four inches and they can dig into that ground unbelievable and tear that ground apart. They're not big climbers. Their cousins, the, the black bears are better climbers, but uh, they can tear up the ground and, you know, anything they want to very, very quickly. And then if you think it's cute enough, you know, watch a bear scratch its head and, uh, then you know that they're on the payroll from Disney or at least from the vendor who's giving you this tour. Quite uh, always a, a fun thing to see when you see the grizzlies, especially when they get up close. These bears are big. Uh, the females are probably in the, you know, 600 pounds. The males go up to maybe 800 pounds. Uh, they're all part of the brown bear family. You hear the coastal bears up in Alaska and the Kodiak bears, they're the ones that live on the coast. They're feeding on salmon and those big boys uh, it's not unusual for them to be about 1,200 pounds. Um, in the, the Kenai Peninsula, there's a, a salmon run there, and they have a cam set up. And if you see the, the bears there, it's unbelievable. And they always have the fattest bear of the year contest there. And 
you know, there's some enormous bears. I mean, you can see they love what they do, which is standing in that water eating salmon, you know, almost all day long. Denali is quite spectacular. And we have arrived at the farthest point in the road which where we will go and you have a beautiful view of Denali, except where is Denali? Again, as I mentioned earlier, only about 30% of people see it. And if you see it like this, it's a pretty good day because now you're seeing you know, a little bit of Denali. You can see the bottom, you can see some of the top, you can see some of the right-hand side. But then, but then, ba-da! You see Denali in all its greatness, both the South Peak to the left, the North Peak to the right. And folks, it doesn't get any better than this. When you see Denali like this, it is just truly spectacular. Uh, you know, zooming in, you see how, you know, it, it's frozen, it has snow on it, you know, all year round. At climbing it, they, they do their climbing early between April and they make sure they try to be off the mountain by the end of June because it gets so dangerous up there. It has its own weather system. The winds are tremendous. Um, it's not unusual for the park service have to make rescues for people who have been exposed to, you know, this, you know, horrible cold, you know, conditions up there. Uh, and also quite dangerous with avalanches and other things, which, you know, a lot of the other great mountains that folks like to climb, you know, they don't have to face uh, those risks. Really a beautiful spot. Uh, Denali is in the heart of Athabascan country. You know, there are many different native Alaskan groups. Uh, the Athabascans are in the, the South Central. Uh, they are one of the smaller groups, even though their territory is, you know, fairly decent sized. Uh, to the north are the in Inupik, uh, which, you know, sometimes are referred to as Eskimo, but Inupik people. A little bit further south on the, the, the western coast are the, the Yupik. And then further down where we are going to go um, on our tour today are the Klinglet and the Haida. Uh, the Athabascans, you know, have done an, ex an excellent job of keeping their culture uh, together, you know, for the folks growing up. And you can see the beautiful coat, which is made here by furs that they've trapped and the embroidery work uh, that's all hand sewn. Uh, absolutely beautiful, uh, the work that they do. Uh, again, it's been, you know, you know, part of their, their life for, you know, generations and generations and generations. Something else which is totally unique in Alaska is the Iditarod, the sled dog race. They call it the last great race. It goes from, it used to go from Anchorage all the way up to Nome. And sled dogs were a part of Alaska life for many, many years. And then with, uh, this is the ceremonial start in downtown Anchorage. Uh, the man in the sled, you know, the, the driver, the actual musher is the man at the back with the bib on with the number three seated in the sled are our citizens and they bid on the opportunity to ride in the sled during that ceremonial start, you know, in, in Anchorage. It starts on 4th Street in, in Anchorage and, uh, and goes from there and they get that little bit of ride then they restart the race the next day up in Willow and then again it finishes in Nome. Uh, here we have uh, Mitch Seavey, you know, on, he's, he's, you know, one of the top mushers, was one of the top mushers up there and Mitch, please excuse me if I said was, because you are still a, one of the top mushers. But uh, the route goes, you know, almost a thousand miles. Originally it went 10, 20, whatever it was from Anchorage. But, you know, now they restart in Willow, it's a little bit under a thousand. But part of that course goes alongside the Bering Sea before you get to the finish line here in, in Nome. And this is uh, Mitch Seavey, you know, bringing home the winner a couple years back. Uh, the dogs, when they get there, even though they've done almost a thousand miles, the only reason why they stop is because they've run out of trail. Uh, they love to run. When you're up there, uh, you might have an opportunity to, you know, see some of these dogs and you will see that they love what they do. They love their sport. Like, like all, you know, athletes, uh, these are remarkable, remarkable, uh, you know, animals. While we're up there, a stop at the Iditarod headquarters. It's located in Wasilla. You know, I highly recommend uh, this is Balto. You may have heard about the Great Serum Run, which, you know, went up the Nome. You know, Balto was the guy that finished the race. Togo was the guy that ran most of it. But, you know, Balto is here. There's also another statue of Balto in Central Park in New York. But this is right outside. 
you know, a fun place to visit. They have an excellent video there on the race and a gift shop with truly unique Iditarod, you know, souvenirs, shirts, hats, uh, hoodies, uh, the whole works and, you know, a lot of excellent literature there. And as I mentioned, you might have a chance to see some sled dogs and actually to ride in a sled. Now this sled is on wheels, but it is still exciting. Uh, that is a musher behind that. This man has uh, has competed in and has finished the musher on several occasions and uh, you know takes these dogs around. Um, these dogs are ready to run when they know they're gonna have visitors. You know, they are excited when they're put in the harness and when they take off, the musher is doing everything he can to hold him back so that he doesn't lose the people in his sled. But I highly recommend a visit to the Iditarod headquarters and especially taking a ride in a sled. You can do it there or you can do it at some of the stops, you know, some of the other stops, you know, on the, the course of your journey. Leaving Wasilla, we're headed south. We're going down to Seward where we're going to catch our cruise ship. But the drive from Seward or from Anchorage down to Seward is quite spectacular. We'll be traveling along what's known as Turnigan Arm. Uh, James Cook was an English explorer and navigator and uh, came over to you know, Alaska. He was actually trying to find the Northern Passage and he was also charting the, the Pacific coast of North America. And he sailed in to what's now called Cook's Inlet. Don't know what it was called back then, but he sent one of his ships down you know, south and when they came back, they said it was just mountains. You know, there was no passage down there. And so Captain Cook noted in his journal, you know, dispatch ship, saw mountains, turn again. And that's where it gets its name, turn again arm. To the north is Kinnick Arm, which goes up to an Athabascan trading post, which, used, which is, was called Kinnick. Uh, the tides there are unbelievable. They have what's known as a bore tide. It's when you get a you know, a super low tide meets an incoming super high tide and you get a wave which can be between five and 10 feet tall. Uh, it is amazing. There's a little dot in the middle. It's actually a surfer out there. This is cold, cold water, but it is, um, you know, quite spectacular to see. Uh, it's a beautiful little area there. Something which is totally unique in Alaska is dip net fishing. Um, Fishing is a huge sport, you know, in Alaska. Dip neck fishing, you're allowed to use these large nets. They cannot be more than five feet in diameter, uh, be it a circle, a square, elliptical, whatever it be. And when the salmon are running, you can go to certain rivers, only certain rivers, which are, you know, sanctioned by the state and fish for, you know, with your net, you know, for the salmon. Uh, you must have a Alaska fishing license you must get a special permit to dip net and you must be a resident of Alaska. The person that has the permit, you can have, you can catch 25 salmon. Each person in your family are carried on the same permit. They can catch 10. So a family of four could have, let's see, 25, 35, 45, 55 salmon. They will take them back and they will, um, you know, fillet them, put them in their freezer and they will have great eating, you know, all through the winter the winter months. Now this lady here, she is dip netting in a different river and this is for uh, hooligans. Uh, it's a type of smelt and uh, they're also called candlefish. They're a very oily fish um, but very popular and some people love these things. I had a bus driver a couple years ago that would do dip netting for, uh, for the hooligans and I asked him well what do they taste like? And he says well it's sort of like oatmeal mush. Now that really wasn't a big selling point for me, but uh, you know, the different tastes for different people. They're also known as candlefish, uh, very you know oily. And um, the Athabascan people would catch them. They would dry them out, stick a wick in their mouth and use them you know, as a source of light, as a candle, uh, candlefish. And now for some reason, that's a fragrance that didn't catch on with Yankee Candle, but um, I could probably understand why. Uh, the Athabascan you know, people and then the native Alaskan people had other ways of fishing. Uh, a slide or two back, we had a picture of a fish wheel or a salmon wheel. There it is, a fish wheel or a salmon wheel. It's set up, goes with the current. The salmon swims into an area where it's not able to get out. 
Uh, there's only, the last I checked, there was only two rivers in Alaska, which still permit salmon wheel, wheel fishing. And it's very, very restricted. Uh, you know, on the, the banks there is a, an Athabascan woman. And this lady can fillet, she will fillet that fish in about a minute. It's just unbelievable, um, you know, how precise she is with a knife in, in filleting that fish. The, you know, Athabascans and all the native, you know, people in Alaska, you know, they would fish when the fishing was, was plentiful. They would take it back. They learned to smoke the fish, put it in strips and dry it. And then they would have, you know, a food supply, which would last all winter long. So you can catch it with a hook, you can dip net it, or you can catch it in a fish wheel. But, uh, you know, plenty of, of salmon, you know, up along our way. We make our way down to Seward, which was the start of the Alaska Railroad. Uh, Seward is a, an ice-free port, a uh, beautiful little town, just a small town. In the back, I believe the backdrop there is uh, Mount Marathon. Uh, on July 4th every year, they had the Marathon Marathon uh, mountain you race where you, the, the object is to get up to the top of the mountain and down as fast as you can, any way you can. Um, you know, pretty neat sport. You know, fishing, as you can see, boating, very, very popular in Seward. And this is where we will get on our cruise ship. And in the distance, you can see the Celebrity Millennium. This is the Millennium just uh, two years ago, underwent a $44 million renovation. And the blue and white hull is now a blue hull and inside is really spectacular. Um, Go Ahead Tours has used Celebrity for many, many years. It is quality through and through an excellent service. This is an inside stateroom, quite comfortable. Um, that's usually where the tour director is. Uh, ocean view staterooms are always nice because the ocean and the inside passage where will be, is the water is just so soothing and, and so relaxing. And then you can always opt for a balcony or what they call a veranda. And now the hat and the camera are extra, but uh, again, you know, a beautiful place to, to go and relax and to spend your cruise. Uh, dining on board these ships is quite spectacular. This is the Metropolitan Dining Room, you know, aboard the Millennium. Uh, it's not just a meal on the Millennium. Um, yeah, and I'm, I just, I'm not giving them a plug. I don't get anything from Millennium, but you know, I like to recognize quality. And, you know, they make dinner you know, not a meal, but an experience. And then after your, your meal, if you've been to the early dinner, uh, take in a show. Uh, they'll have a, they have their own production team, which will do, you know, some reviews. It could be a Broadway review or an oldies but goodies review. And then they have some guest entertainers. The entertainment is usually very good. And, uh, you know, I never miss a show. Uh, just a beautiful, comfortable auditorium. So we're in Seward. You know, we've seen our ship. We've made our way. We'll be pulling out of Seward pretty soon and we'll be going from Seward our stop the first stop will be over by the Hubbard Glacier we will knock it off the ship then we'll be going to Juneau up the Skagway to Icy Strait Point and then to Ketchikan and on a typical go-ahead tour uh, and most of the tours you'll finish up down in Vancouver or you know maybe Seattle or a place but you know today we're going to you know finish up in Ketchikan so let's go sailing on the beautiful millennium as you sail out of Seward, you will be on Resurrection Bay. Uh, when Alexander Baranoff first sailed in, it was on Easter morning, and he was just so overwhelmed by the beauty uh, of the area around him. You know, he named it Resurrection Bay. Sailing out of Resurrection Bay, again, is absolutely gorgeous. I highly recommend uh, being on deck. You don't have to worry about uh, the sunset. You're probably not going to see one if you're there in June. Uh, I've been up there in June. You know, the sun sets officially around 11 something, although you can stand outside and read a newspaper at 11 o'clock at night without any illumination. And then the sun rises way, 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 way early. So it's beautiful out there as you, you sail out of Seward. Uh, always a beautiful sight. Now, as you're sailing along, you know, we're now into uh, the next day. And many times when you're in the Alaska Sea, it's a little bit overcast or foggy. And then just a couple of years ago, it was a beautiful day and I looked out and there in the distance was this absolutely spectacular classic mountain. And it's Mount St. Elias. First time I had seen it probably in, I'd never seen it before. And I've been up there for at least eight years. But Mount St. Elias is the second tallest mountain in North America at a little bit over 18,000 feet tall. And it is 
truly magnificent. Just beyond that, we'll be turning into Yakutat Bay, and in the distance, you will see the Hubbard Glacier. It doesn't look that spectacular from that far out, but you are many, many miles out. As you're looking at it, that's actually six and a half miles wide. As we get closer, you know, it gets a little bit bigger, and then it keeps getting bigger as you keep getting closer. Now, we're not too far out. Now, you see the little cave on the bottom left, and then boom, did you hear that noise? It sounded like thunder. And this is called glacier calving. The ice on the front will all of a sudden break off and fall down. And when it does, you'll see it first, and then a second or so later, you hear this tremendous clasp of thunder, you know, as the, the, uh, the ice breaks away and hits down. Now, this glacier here is probably about over 300 feet tall, and you can see the water, uh, the splash is, you know, at least a third. So you're talking maybe, you know, 100 feet of splash going up. So how big is this glacier? It's big. Uh, it's three to 400 feet out of the water, another eight to 900 feet below the water. And then it goes back about 76 miles. Uh, they say that the snow on the face of the glacier, when it first landed many years ago on the back of the glacier and slowly became part of the glacier and moved forward, the ice on the front is about 400 years old. It takes about 400 years for the ice to migrate from the back of the glacier up to the front. Really a spectacular sight. Our next spot is Juno. When we sail into Juno, you'll be welcomed by Patsy Ann. Uh, Patsy Ann is a, you know, an English bull terrier. Uh, her story goes back into, you know, the early 1930s. She was actually born, you know, I believe in, in Oregon. And she came up when she was just a pup. Uh, she would not stay with her owner. She always wandered off. But they often noticed that she ended up down around the docks about the same time a ship came in. And they also found out that she really had an instinct for determining when the ships would come in. The story goes, and whether it's a tour director story or what, I don't know, but you know, there was a crowd waiting for a ship to come in on one dock and Patsy Ann was over at another. And you know, wouldn't you know, that's the dock that the ship tied up in was Patsy Ann. She became known as the official greeter of Juno and held that distinction for about a dozen years until she finally passed away of old age. But Patsy Ann is still there. Uh, Juno's a beautiful place to visit. Uh, again, it was a gold rush town from the 1870s, I believe it was. Joe Juno and another man, you know, had discovered gold there. Um, the view up top, we were on top of Mount Roberts looking down at Juno. You can see some of the cruise ships. This is the Gastineau Channel down below. Uh, the tram ride's a nice thing to do. Uh, it's about a six minute ride. You go about 3,800 feet up to an elevation of 1,800. And on a beautiful clear day like this, it is fantastic. Now, you didn't hear it from me, but don't buy your tickets ahead of time on a cruise ship. Sorry, Celebrity and other companies. Wait until you see it's a clear day because if you buy your ticket ahead of time and you get there and it's a little bit overcast, which it sometimes can be in the morning, you know, you get a beautiful view of the inside of clouds. Not quite as uh, nice as what you're seeing here. Juno is a fun place to visit. Again, 1870s, I believe, is when it started to go. And, uh, you know, there's some original buildings there dating back to the late 1800s, you know, early 1900s. Uh, it is the capital of Juneau, about 3,200 people there. Its two businesses are government and tourism. Here's the Red Dog Saloon, a popular place to go to wet your whistle. Uh, Wyatt Earp went there. His gun, supposedly, is there. Everybody has to check your gun as you go in with the bartender. And he's allegedly checked his gun and then forgot to take it out, but it's on display there for everybody to see. Uh, Juno is really a neat place. One of the, the features there is the Mendenhall Glacier, totally different from the Hubbard Glacier. This is a hanging glacier and it's, it's quite beautiful. This glacier is receding. It's getting smaller, which is sad, but uh, it's still absolutely beautiful. This is a view of the glacier from Ock Bay. It's spelled A-U-K, Ock Bay. And, uh, you know, looking towards it. Here's a little bit closer up. There's a national park there. I highly recommend a visit to Mendenhall. It is just so graceful the way it kind of winds. Uh, you can take a helicopter, uh, which will land on it, and you can walk on the glacier, or you can just take a, you know, ride a bus up. 
and uh, visit there. To your right, you'll see there's something, you know, some water coming down. That's Nugget Falls, uh, just spectacular. And you can walk out there and, and catch the spray off that wonderful uh, waterfall coming down. Also, there is a, a salmon run there. It's called Steep Creek, right along just to the left there. It's well marked. And these are sockeyes or red, of one of the five varieties of salmon, which are, you know, are popular you know, in Alaska, these are the reds. When, when they're out, they are gray. When they're starting to come into spawn is when they turn that beautiful red color. And most people like salmon, including our national bird, the American Eagle. Um, this one was able to, you know, find a little snack and is enjoying that, you know, along the side of, of Ock Bay. Now, the other thing that, you know, I love to do in Juneau is go whale watching and I highly recommend it. Uh, these are humpback whales. They're the size of a school bus, about 40 feet long, about 40 tons, and they are spectacular. Uh, they are feeding up there. They migrate back and forth between Hawaii and Alaska. That's a pretty good deal. Long way to swim, but a pretty good deal. And, uh, you know, they're up there. This is the classic tail shot. This whale is getting ready to do a deep dive you know, going down, you know, looking for food and coming back. Most whales are solitary. If there's a mom, she'll have the calf, you know, probably for the first year and uh, they will be up there. Here you have the whale on your right. The back is kind of arches ready to go down. You'll have another whale to your left. You can see the fins are up in the air. He's going to use those big powerful fins to propel himself, you know, down into the depths of the water. It looks like it's fairly close, but again, you know, this is, is very deep water that these whales are operating in, feeding in, I should say. And, uh, you know, they, they go down very fast and stay down there for a while, usually for about six, seven minutes. Now, as I mentioned, usually whales are solitary animals or maybe just with, a, with their baby. But during the latter part of July, maybe the first part of August, they will gather together in a social group for what's called bubble net feeding. And if you get to see that, Wow, buy a lottery ticket because it is, you know, awesome. The whales gather together. One of the whales will sort of take charge, emit a signal. They will all dive at the same time down. Then when they reach a certain depth, you know, amongst the fish, there'll be another signal emitted. The whales will release their air. It will form a circle of bubbles. It will trick the fish into rising up and they will come up behind them with their mouths open, just gulping in as many fish as they can. Uh, truly remarkable to see. And when they hit the surface, you hear them hit the surface. And, you know, they just pop up wherever they might pop up. Uh, these two boats had a great view. And of course, I'm on a boat on the other side shooting that. Uh, and whales, you know, the young whales especially, they kind of like to show off. Uh, the big whales, the ones which are 40 feet, they're really not going to do something like this. But these younger whales, you know, they love to put on a show. And uh, going out in Ock Bay outside of Juneau is a great place to see whale watching. You had a great day on the water. You know, you're starting to go back into the dock and you look out to your left, you see beautiful Eagle Glacier and you think, wow, it doesn't get much better than this. But then, uh-huh, a couple orcas, the killer whales appear. Uh, and these are beautiful, graceful animals. These only go about 20 feet long. That dorsal fill in the back, that can be five to almost six feet, and uh, they are quite something. They are also, they like to put on a show. And before you know it, you know, you have, uh, you know, a show being, you know, right in front of you as these things just seem to take off. It's almost like they know that they have you, and they start doing this. And then you have this guy here who thinks he's Michael Jackson doing a moonwalk. And I got to admit, I've seen Michael Jackson, and that's pretty cool. But after I saw this orca, you know, do the uh, the moonwalk, you know, uh, Michael, you know, if he was still around, you know, he he couldn't even compete with, you know, this this little fella here. Always a fun thing to do, and they also like uh, the photo bomb. So, you know, be careful when you're when you're out there that you know they'll spoil a good picture, you know, on you. Our next stop is Skagway. Skagway is another gold rush town. The Klondike Gold Rush, uh, there was no gold right there in Skagway, but the way to get to the Klondike, you had a couple ways, and one of the ways was to land in Skagway off a ship and then make your way up through the, the White Pass and then 
make a ridiculously hard journey up into the Klondike. But out of nowhere, this little town of Skagway popped up uh, for, you know, about, I think, I think it was like 1887, a guy named William Moore, you know, arrived there with his family. And he was there for, you know, about 10 years all by himself. And then somebody discovered gold in the Klondike and the word got down to the lower 48. And everybody was excited and you had people leaving everything to go up there. And, uh, you know, Skagway, you know, took, took off. Uh, there are many original buildings. Here you had the Red Onion Saloon. It was located about four blocks, you know, away from where it is now, but some of the buildings they've moved around a little bit. A neat place to live. It was uh, one of many bars and brothels which popped up as Skagway became known as one of the toughest towns in, you know, all of Alaska because of, uh, you know, all the activities were going there between the con men and, the, you know, people trying to swindle each other other things which were going on, uh, quite something else. And then uh, one of my favorite places to visit there is the Skagway Hardware Store. This is one of the stores in Skagway which stays open year round. Their motto is, if we don't have it, you don't need it. But it's fun to go inside and here in this little small store, it's amazing what they have, all kind of cool stuff. Uh, if you're in Skagway, pop in. Uh, you'll find something you'll say, wow, I haven't seen this in a long time. Or, wow, I'm gonna get that, but a fun place to visit. Also in Skagway, you had the Skagway Brewing Company. Uh, and, you know, for those that like a, you know, a cold beer and, you know, you're concerned it might be a health risk, at the Skagway Brewing Company, they have a spruce tip beer. And uh, they found that spruce tips are very high in vitamin C and vitamin C is good for you. So, you know, if you need your vitamins, you know, the Skagway Brewing Company will be glad to help you out with, you know, make sure you don't come down with, you know, some vitamin C deficiency. Skagway is a beautiful, beautiful area. Just out of Skagway, I highly recommend either taking the Yukon and White Pass Railroad or one of the little bus trips which go, you know, outside the city. And on the left of your screen, you see Reed Falls, just spectacular. Um, just a short walk, you know, over to Reed Falls. Pitchfork Falls, you actually can see from uh, the Klondike Highway. And uh, this is almost a half mile of waterfalls coming down. It starts at Goat Lake up on top and it comes down, it cascades down all the way to the Skagway River down below. Uh, really a nice place to, to visit. Highly recommend uh, you know, a trip up there. As I mentioned, the Yukon and White Pass Railroad, a fun way to, to you know, go up into the White Pass. There you had the train. This was actually headed back into town, but uh, you know, they follow the original track which was laid down with the idea of getting them the prospectors you know up into the area of the Yukon uh, where they could continue their venture you know up to the Klondike uh, to look for gold you know none of them ever got there and made their uh, any money but uh, you know that was the goal uh, my favorite falls is Bridal Vale Falls this is right off the Klondike Highway and I encourage my people to go down alongside the falls and just cup your hand and lap up some of the glacier water. It is really refreshing, you know, just so clear uh, and, and delicious. And you know, usually quite a few of my guests, you know, will take me up on that and they'll say, hey, that's pretty good stuff. But a neat place to visit. When you make your way up, uh, if you're going out either on the railroad, you'll eventually make your way up into Tormented Valley. Tormented Valley is where the train will turn around. Tormented Valley is where our bus tour turns around. And you get up there and you have these beautiful, beautiful areas up there with these little kettle ponds. Uh, you can see the fireweed, you know, all in bloom. And, uh, you know, it just makes for some, some beautiful photos, just so peaceful and relaxing up there. And occasionally you'll have an American Eagle who is vacationing also in Skagway and flew up to uh, British Columbia. We're actually in British Columbia where Tormented Valley is and, uh, you know, is enjoying the view also. Now, you will see a sign up there, it says avalanche. And, you know, don't be looking for the avalanche as these folks were. Uh, this is an area where there's a lot of recreation in the wintertime where folks go up and they take their snow machines. They don't have snowmobiles there. These are snow machines or they do cross country skiing or other things. But, you know, you have the warning signs because the area up there is subject to avalanches. But uh, no, you will not see an avalanche up there in the summertime. And coming back in, you will, you know, if you've been, uh, you know, on a, a bus tour, you stop at the Welcome to Alaska sign. The views there are spectacular and it makes for a great photo. 
and you know to make this part of your collection just a fun stop and occasionally on the way you'll come across you know another creature this is a black bear and now you're saying that looks brown on my screen uh, black bears can be brown can be black the brown bears which include the grizzlies and the coastal bears they can be brown they can be black they can be that blonde color like uh, some of the ones we saw the the Black bears, you can see his ears are a little bit bigger and his snout is a little bit longer. Uh, and the, the brown bears are usually a lot bigger. Uh, this bear is out, he is almost on the road. Uh, it's, I think I was up there in May this time and he had just come out of hibernation. They're very dehydrated and he's eating dandelions because dandelions are high in, you know, in uh, hydration and you know, that's what he's doing there. And as long as I, we left the dandelions alone, he was fine. Uh, Skagway is a unique place. Now here you have a house giving birth to a trailer, but where else can you see something like that? But uh, you know, Skagway, truly a fun place to visit. One of my favorite places to visit. And then as we're sailing out, you'll be in the Lynn Canal going to our next destination. And again, it is absolutely beautiful and spectacular. Uh, our next stop along the way is Icy Strait Point. Uh, this is an old fishing village. Uh, the red buildings you see at one time was part of a cannery. And uh, today it's part of, um, you know, it, it's set up for visitors coming in on cruise ships. It's operated by the Hunam Totem Corporation uh, during the Alaska Claims Settlement Act, which uh, compensated Alaska Native people for, you know, their land being taken from them and, and other things. Uh, they received almost a uh, billion dollars and some of it went directly to the Alaskan people and to about 200 different you know, villages of native people. And then the government also set up 12 corporations so that money can be invested and these people could start businesses and do well. And Hunam Totem, uh, I give them all the credit. They have created a beautiful, beautiful stop here for you know several different other cruise ships. The closest town is Hunam, which is about you know, a little bit more than a mile or so in town. And you can see the Celebrity Millennium tied up. Uh, it is just beautiful. There's little walkways around. You know, you just, I mean, it's, you know, these picturesque places with the old fishing boats, uh, you know, nearby. And then just looking around. Uh, there's things to do there. They have the world's longest zip line. It's over a mile long. Hey, if you have your fishing pole with you, you can throw a line and see if you can, you know, snag, uh, you know, a little bit of fish you know, while you're there, you'll have to let it go. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is find that perfect rock and just see if I can skim along the beautiful clear waters of Icy Strait Point. Uh, it is a gorgeous place to visit. Uh, I, I'd say one of my favorites, but it's, you know, it's, I, I really don't have a favorite. They're all so neat. As I mentioned, the Huda Totem Corp, one of the things that they do is they get the young people involved in their culture so that you know, their traditions, their culture uh, does not end. It, it continues on for future generations. And then, you know, they put on the, this mostly Klinglet and, you know, native uh, Alaskans, and they put on some excellent shows where they demonstrate their dances and their music and, uh, you know, an excellent opportunity there. And Old Faithful, uh, again, I've been going to Icy Strait Point for 10 years and there's been a pair of eagles uh, they mate for life. This is a, a Sitka spruce, which is, you know, well over 100 feet uh, off the ground, right on the shoreline. And uh, this eagle is up there every time that I've been there. And sometimes uh, the mate is there also. And sometimes they fly around for you and put on the show, but they're always up there looking just so regal and so beautiful. And again, the, the sights there, here's a fishing boat coming in. You look at it, it's so tranquil, it's so beautiful. Um, just a wonderful feeling to sail out. You know, I highly encourage people don't be down in your stateroom, you know, be somewhere else, be up on deck and, you know, see the beautiful, beautiful area that you're sailing through. Our next stop is Ketchikan, uh, the southernmost, you know, part of that southeastern part of Alaska. And it's called the first city because when the ships were coming up from uh, Portland or Seattle or San Francisco, the first place they would stop in Alaska would be Ketchikan. It was originally you know, a fishing village, they had lumber. Uh, it was a lumber operation for a while, you know, many different things. Now it's a popular, you know, place for cruise ships to dock. Um, here you have in uh, Ketchikan, 
one of the translations that you hear is the thundering wings of eagles. So you have uh, that beautiful eagle totem pole there. Uh, one of the things that's been in Ketchikan is the welcome arts. I believe the original welcome arts was, you know, first went up in the 1930s. It kind of got, it was replaced um, about a, 10 years or so later. And then they put up an, another arch. And this is the third version of the arch. Uh, it, this one is lighted and, you know, quite beautiful. And again, perfect setting for a photograph. That is Dock Street, uh, which goes down and, you know, just a great place to stop. Um, Ketchikan is set up in two towns. This is the new town where the folks were uh, posing by the Welcome to Ketchikan sign. That is the old town. The old town, of course, was settled first. And then you can see things are on stilts over there. A lot of it was um, built on stilts on both sides. So how do you get back and forth? It's quite easy. Uh, you can, you know, to your right here, you can climb the steps and you can go over the ridge or a little bit further up, there's a street which will take you over. Or you can drive through the tunnel and go through, or you can go around on your left and there's a street which actually goes out and will bring you around the other way. It's in the Guinness book as I think the uh, only mountain that you can drive through, climb over or girl, go around, um, you know, anywhere. Uh, Ketchikan is also a very, very wet spot. Uh, this is the, the liquid sunshine gauge um, measuring, you know, how much water they have. They used to have two fish. The bottom one uh, got knocked off and they haven't replaced it. The top one is the in the record amount and they used to keep track but you know it's not unusual for catch can to get 13 feet of rain a year during the summer they just have light showers that come and go i've had so many absolutely gorgeous days there and if it rains it might be raining in the morning and then you know it disappears you know later on and makes for a very very nice day Ketchikan is a spot where people love to go fishing. Uh, this is Ketchikan Creek. This is the Stedman Bridge over Ketchikan Creek. And this is full combat fishing. Uh, what you're probably going to catch there is another person's line, but they're all hoping for that, a chance to grab, that's right, a salmon coming in. Uh, they are headed in. They're going to work their way up to Ketchikan Creek and spawn. And they are some pretty big fish coming in. Uh, you have to catch the fish has to bite on your hook. You just can't, you know, hook them with so many fishermen there. The poor salmon might run into a line. Uh, if you catch it that way, you have to release it. On the other side uh, is what's called Creek Street. And the buildings on the right, you know, back in the, you know, early part of the 1900s and 1920s and 30s, uh, these were all brothels. On the left-hand side of Creek Street, going towards the town side, uh, prostitution was illegal. On the right-hand side, if there was two ladies or less, it would be uh, permissible, or let's just say the law wasn't quite enforced on the other side of the bridge. So Ketchikan Creek there, there's another view looking down. The most popular view is the first one you saw, but this is my favorite one looking down. Directly in the center is a greenhouse. That's Dolly Roberts's house. She was probably the best known madam. She passed away quite some years ago, but for many years, she operated this place. And, you know, on the side of the building there, again, it's Ketchikan Creek where the salmon come to spawn. But, you know, the signage on the side of her building is, you know, where salmon and men come to spawn. Now, you can take tours. Now, here you have part of Ketchikan Creek. And if I was a salmon, I have to be honest with you, I would get to this far and I would look at some of these rapids and I would say to myself, you know, this spawning thing might be overrated. Uh, maybe I'll just turn around, you know, and you know, maybe come back in a year or two. And then it gets a little bit rougher. Yes, indeed. This is these falls here. Yeah, and here you can see in the, oh, the lower part on the left-hand side, a salmon trying to get up. This is probably 30 feet, of, 30 feet of falls coming down and the water is pounding down. And it's hard to believe that anything, I mean, I couldn't climb that thing. And yet these fish are just, amazing at being able to, you know, gather the strength and make their way up to the top. Once they get to the top, you know, they're able to relax a little bit. And, uh, you know, here you see these are, are what's called pinks or humpies, uh, another type of salmon. There's five types of salmon which are popular in Alaska. And if you use your hand, your thumb, they have the chum salmon, sometimes called the dog salmon. 
that's used quite often in you know making you know food for dogs and cats and horses and things like that. Then you have your pointer finger. That would be the sock eye, uh, because that's the finger you sock people in the eye with, or the reds. We saw a sock eye earlier. Your large finger, your middle finger, is the the king salmon because that's your largest finger. Your ring finger, because a lot of rings are silver, that's the silver salmon. And then your little pinky finger, because it's your pinky finger, it's the pink salmon. And pink salmon is very popular. They're all very tasty. They're all good. Um, and here we have, they've made their way up there near the spawning. Now, if you don't like salmon and you want a challenge, you can always go outside of Ketchikan and try to get yourself a halibut. You know, they are big, big fishes. And, uh, you know, there they are. You have to go out, you have to buy a, you have to have your license and you have to have a stamp to get your halibut. Now, not everybody likes salmon. Not everybody likes halibut. And, or maybe you've had plenty. Uh, they have an excellent, you know, international food district in Ketchikan. Here we have Chico's Mexican restaurant, the best pizza in town. And just down the street from it's the new China restaurant. I don't know what happened to the old China restaurant, but again, just an option to the salmon or the halibut. Uh, although the salmon and the halibut, boy, it, you can't be, you know, good for that fresh fish. And Ketchikan is also a place which is, uh, has a wealth of totem poles. Uh, this is out at Totem Bite State Park. This is a clan house with a frontal lodge pole. And uh, this was probably, this is, you know, a replica which was set up here in, in the state park. But, you know, in a, uh, and these are, are Klinglet native Alaskans here. You know, it would be a person well-respected, you know, in their group, which would have that clan house uh, with the totem frontal pole. And the totem poles often tell stories. Um, it's quite amazing, you know, some of the stories. I love some of the stories that come with them. Uh, originally, the colors were made from using tree moss or salmon eggs, charcoal, um, you know, blueberries and blackberries, mud, uh, even grass stains to get the many different colors. Uh, the wood is usually a red cedar because red cedar holds up so well under the, the wet conditions there. It's easy to carve and it's rather straight. Um, and there are many, many beautiful ones around uh, Ketchikan. Now, this is my favorite you know, totem, you know, anywhere. Uh, it's in, it's in Ketchikan in a park. It's right over near Ketchikan Creek, just on the other side. And uh, it tells the story of a fog woman. The pole was dedicated uh, to Chief Johnson. Chief Johnson was a Klinglet chief. Uh, when ships would come in, Chief Johnson was usually down there welcoming the people and uh, oftentimes was, was, was giving them gifts. And you know, years later, this pole was, was dedicated to him. And it tells the story of Fog Woman. Now, we don't have a close enough view, so I can't tell you all the detail in there. But the, the lower face, probably about 25% up, is a, is a picture of Fog Woman. You'll notice that the top part of the pole, you know, is, you know, there's nothing carved there. And because that's because Chief Johnson was held in high esteem. Now, the, this, the, the totems tell stories. And again, this is my favorite story. Um, and it tells a story of, you know, from, from Klinglet lore, folklore. Uh, in Klinglet folklore, uh, the raven is a heroic figure. Um, and there's different stories that will tell you that, you know, raven was the creator of the earth and many things. But this story talks about raven and, uh, you know, with his friends one day down by the river. And it was a time when, you know, there was deep famine, there wasn't much to eat, and they were trying to fish. And all they were catching were something called bullfishes, which are bony fish, and uh, the meat's not very good. Uh, and it was really lousy. And then a fog appeared over the water, and out of the fog walked this beautiful woman. And she walked up to Raven, and she said, you know, give me a basket of water, of fresh water. And so quickly, Raven turned to one of his men and says, hurry, quick, get her a basket of fresh water. They were just stunned that this lady had walked out of the fog. They'd never seen her before. And so one of Raven's men brings back this basket of fresh water and she touches it just gently with her hands and then pours the water, you know, into the river. And all of a sudden the salmon appear. And then Fog Woman teaches Raven and his companions how to fish for the salmon, how to smoke the salmon and preserve them for the, the winter so they would have food to eat all year long. And 
you know, it became a wonderful relationship that's, that Raven and Fog Woman married. And they had a wonderful relationship. But Raven, you know, Raven had a different side to him. And after a period of time, you know, Raven became disgruntled. He was very greedy. He always wanted more. And so he was constantly putting demands on Fog Woman. Bring me more. I need more salmon. Come on, woman. What are you doing? And he got to the point where he, he was arguing with her. And then one day, in a fit of anger, he struck Fog Woman. And with that, Fog Woman turned around and said, I'm leaving you, Raven. And Raven just laughed at her. And Fog Woman walked away. And then Raven realized as she was getting closer to the river, Fog Woman was serious because he could see a fog developing in the distance. And so he quickly ran after her. And he was almost a step away when he reaches out with his arms to try to grab Fog Woman. And when he grabs her, he pulls his arms back and there's nothing there but the mist. And then the next thing you see are all the salmon following Fog Woman out of the rivers. Now, Fog Woman was a loving woman and she would look down on the people in the community where she had lived. And even though Raven had treated her terribly, the people were always very nice. So she took pity on them. And so she said to her daughter, Creek Woman, Creek Woman, go to the head of every stream. And when the fog appears, call the salmon back. And so that is the legend of how the salmon come back to spawn, you know, every year, thanks to Fog Woman and Creek Woman. That's my favorite story. There's a lot of neat ones. Now, this one, you're trying to figure out what in the world is this clown doing putting this in here? Well, totems are created and, you know, they are dedicated and they stay there. They usually do not fix them up and they let them stay there until they deteriorate and they consider it part of the life cycle with that red cedar disintegrating, going back into the earth, being, you know, enveloped into the earth and then will eventually come back forth as something else. And from this view, it looks like the owner of the totem believes the same thing will happen with that house. Not sure what that house will come back as, but you know, who knows? We'll have to come back in 100 years and see. Well, as you can see, you know, we have reached the end uh, following our few little bears. I hope you've enjoyed our little you know, trip to Alaska. If you've been, I saw where there's quite a few of you have been. I hope it rekindled some fond memories uh, of your, your trip up there. You know, if you're thinking about going, hey, you know, this is just a tiny bit. You know, I've been many, many times. Uh, I was so disappointed when I could not go this year, but I'm looking forward to, you know, tourism opening up and being able to go back because I know I will see some of my favorite things and I will see some of my new favorite things. Oh, that was excellent. Thank you, Bob. I'm so excited to go to Alaska now next year. And I hope that if anybody wants to join us, please email me at marawalsh at gmail.com. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about putting you on in, into our group to uh, go up there with Bob. So Bob, we have a ton of questions, or at least they're coming in. If anybody needs to ask a question, please do so in the Q&A so that we can see them. Um, and I can go over them with Bob. Um, I'm going to put the slide up. I think it's up right now for the questions. So let's kind of go through these, Bob, and see what we can address. One sure. of the things um, everybody wants to know when we're talking about a virtual tour is about the weather. And I know we were talking about it before we started the tour. Why don't you talk a little bit about the weather when we travel between June, July, and August and what it's like now and daylight versus darkness? Yes, indeed. Alaska has some weather. Uh, I have been up there in August wearing everything I have, you know, all layered up. I've been there in May and September, you know, wearing shorts. Uh, you never know. So I always tell my folks, you know, prepare to, you know, to layer up on your clothing. One thing to remember is uh, Alaska, you know, a lot of it, you know, especially the popular tourist places, every place we visited, um, you know, in the southeastern part on the cruise, you know, you're part of a, a, a rainforest and, you know, it's not unusual to catch some rain. So it's not rain all day long. It's just maybe a shower here or there. So again, I recommend, you know, having, you know, something waterproof, a jacket, you know, waterproof hat. Uh, they always make, you know, it's always a whole lot better. Uh, good walking shoes are a must. Um, daylight, uh, again, I mentioned in June, I was up there for the summer uh, equinox 
And I mean, it was as bright as could be. And even the other months, you know, it's quite nice. Um, Mara and I were just, you know, chatting beforehand. You know, I keep track of a place called, you probably heard of Barrow, Alaska, way, way up there on the North Slope. It's, they changed their name a couple of years ago to Ukeavik, uh, which is the Athabascan. No, I'm not sure, that's not Athabascan, that's um, in, in Yupik uh, language. And uh, it's a place where root grows, I think it is. But uh, today they had 27 minutes of daylight and I'm not sure if it's tomorrow or the next day, they will have their last sunset for 67 days. And then the sun will slowly start to come out little by little by little. And then when you get to the summer, you know, again, there's no sunsets because, you know, the sun is up continuously. Now, the areas where we visit between Denali and, and Ketchikan, um, they say there's darkness, although it, it's rare that I've ever seen it. Um, you know, they have blackout curtains in hotel rooms. They have them, you know, on the ship so you can get to sleep. But uh, you can go out. A lot of times, you know, I will, you know, I usually try to get the early dinner. You know, I will go to the show and the show is usually over just before 10 o'clock. I'll go out and walk on deck uh, because it's always light. And, you know, the, the beauty of Alaska is just spectacular. That's awesome. Bob, in the 10 years you've been there, have you seen that climate change has impacted Alaska and and um, its environment? Well, you know, I've I've heard people talk about that. You know, it's not so that uh, the the biggest thing you see is Mendenhall Glacier. It has shrunk significantly. Uh, we saw pictures, you know, of it. You know, pretty wide. It has receded quite a bit. Um, so that you know, could be attributed to, to climate change. Um, you know, other than that, you know, I really don't see it that much, but you know, again, I'm, I'm just a layman, you know, I'm not zoned in uh, many, many scientists up there and, you know, I, I would defer to them. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the reindeer, especially the reindeer sausage that we saw. Um, does yes. it taste similar to venison? Is it hunted? What, um, how, how does that become such a delicacy there? Well, it's, you know, they're actually farmed for, um, you know, you know, for their meat and, um, you know, that the, they're produced those sausage. Now, you know, if, if you, you know, hunt for caribou, uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit different, maybe a little bit more, you know, gamier uh, because it's, it's been wild. But, um, you know, the, the trick up there is, you know, is your spices and, um, you know, there's a, a bus driver friend of mine. He he drives the van, you know, from the airport to the hotel, and uh, you know, usually he will get a moose, you know, during the winter. Now he doesn't hunt moose, but if a moose is, you know, sadly struck by a car or a truck, uh, people can you know sign up to go out and harvest the carcass, and so you have so much time to be able to do that, and then it goes down to the next person. But you know, he talks with great pride about you know, how delicious it is. But, you know, what you're going to have is some kind of sausage. Uh, you're not going to have a moose steak because, you know, you'd be chewing that bite for hours and hours and hours. It'd be so hard. So, you know, they, they grind it up, you know, and probably the same thing for the, the reindeer and, uh, or the caribou. You know, I've had reindeer meatballs, very good. I've had the reindeer sausage, you know, very good. Um, you know, it's all tasty. It, it's unique. You know, it's, you're not going to find that in, in you know Tennessee or Florida or Pennsylvania, so you know when Alaska, do us the Alaskans. So it doesn't taste like chicken, like everything else that we say. That mm, not not quite. <laughs> no matter rugged, how much poultry season you put on it, it's not going to taste like chicken. Right, exactly. How rugged are the roads and highways to drive north into Alaska from Canada? Do you know about the roadways at all? Well, the Canadian American you know highway, which is you know it's the only way to get up into those places. I mean, that's an excellent road. Uh, it's comparable to our interstates. Once you get in Alaska itself, you know, there are only a couple major roads. You know, the road that goes up to Denali is the Parks Highway and named after George Parks, the first colonial, you no, know, the territorial governor of Alaska. That's a beautiful paved road. Uh, it's only, you know, two lanes wide uh, and we're up there in the summer. You know, they claim they have two seasons up there, winter and road construction. So they have to do the road construction in the summertime you do get some delays, but the road is excellent. Now, with that said, you know, you will see a lot of side roads. 
And once you get on those side roads, you have about 20 feet of, of blacktop and then you're on dirt or gravel. And then once you get out there, you know, it's subject to, you know, all the potholes and puddles and, and everything else. So there's more unpaved road by far than what there is, what there are paved roads. When you take the Tundra Wilderness Tour through Denali, again, the first maybe 20 miles are paved road. And then you get into the park deeper where only these buses are allowed to go. And that is a gravel road. And the park service does a fantastic job. They're constantly working out there, grading it, uh, filling in gravel and spots uh, to make it as best as possible. You're gonna bounce around a little bit, but that's why you're in this type of, like a converted school bus has a little bit better you know, shocks on it so you're not bouncing all over the place and you're high up off the ground because there's some tight spots out there. Yeah. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the indigenous tribes? I know you mentioned a few. Can you give us some names of them and the regions where they are? Yes. Uh, in the north, there are the Inupiaq. Uh, don't ask me how to spell it. I think it's I-N-U-P-I-K. And that would be what we consider the Alaskan. They would probably be the second largest group. Uh, the Yupik are the southwestern uh, group, which is the largest group of um, indigenous people. About, uh, I think it's about 15% of the population of Alaska, you know, are native Alaskans. Uh, Athabascans, you know, they're in the central part, the south central part. They're actually one of the smaller groups. You had the Klinglet and the Haida, which are down through the, the southeast, uh, Ketchikan, Skagway, you know, in those areas there. Out in the Aleutian Islands, you had the Aleuts, um, you know, which go out quite a ways. They're, they're the major groups. There are, I believe, 20 different, uh, there's, there's probably about 10 different, um, you know, groups. Some are smaller than others and some are kind of combined. And there's 20 different dialects uh, of native language which are spoke up there. And um, down in Ketchikan, there's a, a lady, Dolores Churchill. And, um, you know, she is a, a Klinglet lady and she, she didn't know how to speak Klinglet. And in talking to some of the elders, she found there were very, very few people. And so she has made it her project to interview as many, you know, Klinglet, uh, you know, elders there to try to, um, you know, create, or to try to bring back that language and to teach it to the younger you know, you know, cling the people in the community. I think it's a wonderful thing. And Nathan Jackson uh, is a master carver of totems. And, you know, he lives in Ketchikan and you can visit his workshop. But again, wanting to continue the, the proud tradition and, and the art, it's truly an art form of carving the totems. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Harper, do you know the well, years? Is he alive, dead, or when did he live? And, you know, sadly, um, I believe it was 1913 when he, uh, you know, was part of the expedition. He was 20 years old, very, very bright. Um, you know, he finished his schooling. He was accepted into a medical school in Pennsylvania, in, in Philadelphia. And, you know, I'm from that region, but I, I haven't been able to track down exactly which medical school he was going to. Just before he left, he got married. Uh, he was married to another Athabascan girl. They traveled down to Skagway and boarded a steamer ship uh, called the Sophia. And sadly, you know, a day or two out of Skagway, they while they were still in the Lynn Canal, it ran into a terrible storm. Uh, the ship was forced off course, uh, hit a, you know, a rock, uh, and everybody on board, you know, lost their life, including Walter and his bride. Uh, a sad ending to, um, you know, a very talented young man. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let us... Wish I could have given you a better story, but yeah, that's what happened right. to, that's a sad, to Walter. That's a sad one. Let's talk about gold panning. Yes. Uh, gold panning, is that known for the... Um, is it the Sasitna Sus River? Um, if you're going to do some gold... I mean, there's, there's still gold up there. When you're up around Fairbanks, and we didn't go to Fairbanks in our tour, you know, there's still a couple active gold mines up there where they're mining for gold. Also in Juneau, they mine for gold, but there's several places. There, there's one of the mines is still open, I believe. Um, but there's several places, I think in, in Juneau and Skagway for sure, where they will take you over to an area and you can pan for gold. They will show you how to do it. They will give you a little bag, you know, full of stuff. And uh, you put it in, 
in your pan and you shake it around. And if you find gold, you, know, you can keep it. There's gold This is in, in each one of those bags, but if you're like me, you lose your gold and, you know, in a hurry. Uh, but there are prospectors up there. Um, I was with, with my buddy, you know, our uh, go ahead man in Alaska. He's a native of Alaska, but he sets everything up for us. And I was with my buddy, uh, Joe, uh, and we were out by the airport waiting. And there's a beautiful pull off there near Earthquake Park. And um, we're sitting there just viewing it. And we see some guy kind of ragged looking coming up. And uh, so Joe rolls down the window and offers him a bottle of water. And we get to talking to him and he's a prospector. And he unfolds this map that's been folded hundreds of times. And he starts pointing out the different places and telling us, yeah, I think it's right over here. So now I haven't heard of him making that big find yet. That was several years ago. But I mean, there are still people up there, you know, following maps, following hunches. Um, you know, people still find gold. It's not the big strikes, but they, they might find gold up there because a lot of it up there. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I know, Bob, that most of these pictures are yours. Are they taken between the months of May and September? Yes, every photo uh, that you saw there, which were mine, and most of them were probably 90%, that was between May and September. And, you know, I've, um, you know, our company often will have, you know, tours during that range. And, you know, I've done every month up there. And every month is different. Uh, September was absolutely gorgeous with the fall colors coming in. I've been after up there after snow has hit and uh, you know, but that's what you can expect. That is one of the questions. Is there a better time to see Denali or is it just luck? It's just luck. Uh, I mean, you know, they say, well, get up there earlier in the year. Eh, you know, I've been there in May and I've seen rain. Um, you know, you don't know till you get there and, and you know, I follow it and you know, it's, it's a trick. Um, you know, you'll be following the weather forecast, but Denali, I mean, it can be beautiful everywhere. I mean, you can be in Talkeetna and it'll be absolutely gorgeous. And you look up towards Denali, there's no Denali there. Yeah. And even when you're in the park, you know, it can be a beautiful day. You get out to what's called the Stony Point Lookout, where I took those photos of, uh, of Denali. And, uh, you know, there's no Denali there. That's why I included some of the, the missing Denalis just... Because again, only 30%, you can become part of that 30% club if you get to see Denali. What is, um, is Denali what they used to call Mount McKinley? Yes. Um, the original name, of course, the Athabascan people called it Denali, uh, meaning the great one. But during the uh, late 1800s, I think it was like in oh, the early 1890s, there was a prospector named William Dickey from Ohio. And he was up in that area and he spotted it. At the time, William McKinley, who was also from Ohio, he was running for the presidency and he supported the gold standard. Uh, his opponent was, you know, on the silver standard. And so he wanted to honor William McKinley. And so he called it uh, Mount McKinley. Uh, William McKinley was never in Alaska, never saw Denali, but it remained, you know, Mount McKinley for many years until probably about maybe four or five years ago during President Obama's administration. I mean, the native people and Alaska people had been after the government for years to change the name back to Denali. And it was finally about, you know, five years ago, six years ago, that it officially changed back to Denali. So a uh, little conversation about Anchorage and the distance to Denali. How far out of Anchorage do you have to go to see Denali? Well, it depends on whether you're driving or you know, riding in a car. You can drive up to uh, the park in a car and you can probably do that in maybe five hours. Uh, you might be able to do it in less, um, you know, if the road's good and you don't hit construction. If you're taking the railroad, it's going to take you almost eight hours. Uh, again, because the railroad is very slow because of the, uh, the tight turns and everything. And it's, again, you're on the rail so you can see the beautiful, beautiful scenes. But if you were, if you were just driving, you know, from, you know, from Anchorage up to Denali, you can do it in four to five hours. Do you have to take a cruise to see the best spots in Alaska or can you do it by land or is it just too time consuming to do it by land? Well, it's, again, Alaska is enormous. Uh, and some of these places are very, very difficult to get to. Uh, Juneau and Ketchikan, you get there one of three ways. You get there by ship, by airplane or by birth canal. There are no roads which connect 
you know, Ketchikan and Juneau to the rest of Alaska, you know, or to, to British Columbia. Skagway, um, you would have to go from Skagway up into British Columbia, up into the Yukon, eventually get onto the Alcan Highway and, you know, drive, you know, down into the States, you know, that way. Uh, it's a long, long way to go. Um, and again, the, the beauty is, you know, along the coastal areas. I mean, there's some neat places, you know, in the interior too, uh, to visit. And there's so many different tours. Uh, look them over, see what appeals to you. Uh, I love the coastal areas, um, you know, and, and I love Denali. Uh, so let's talk about the tour we just did in relationship to it being a physical tour. How many days is this tour that we just did virtually if we translated it into a physical tour? You could talk about the one I'm doing. That's about what we just did. Um, okay, now your tour is what, 14 days? Yes, 14, half okay. and half. The, the standard tour is, is about 12 days. Uh, our company, Go Ahead, offers a two-day extension in Vancouver, uh, in which you have an opportunity to go to Victoria and uh, to also tour Vancouver, Vancouver, which is a beautiful, beautiful city. But, you know, plan on spending about 12 days there. It takes a day to get there. Um, you know, I fly, you know, from Atlanta to Anchorage. It's eight hours. Um, you get very comfortable. Even if you're flying from Seattle, I believe it's still five hours you know, in the plane. Uh, so it's a long way to go. Hey, if you're going up to Fairbanks, it's even further. Sure. Northern Lights, are there, is there viewing from Alaska? What months do you have to go? Is it even possible to do this from Alaska? Well, uh, again, I've been going up there for 10 years. I've seen the Northern Lights once. Uh, we had sailed out of Ketchikan and we were headed down into the Inside Passage. And, um, you know, I was in a, on deck 10 on lane, they have a, a beautiful lounge up there and they have an evening show and they were having an, an you know, uh, an oldies but goodies show up there. And I love oldies but goodies. So I was up there and uh, listening to the entertainment and tapping my foot. All of a sudden, the captain interrupts, comes on the last speaker and interrupts the performers and said the Northern Lights are out. Wow. And with that, the theater emptied, including the performers. <laughs> you know, there's nobody left inside, the bartender, everybody you know, is outside on the decks. And for about, you know, 20, 25 minutes, we were treated to just a spectacular sight. Our captain turned off all of the lights. Captain, I don't want to get you in trouble. Turned off all the lights except for the running lights so that other ships could see them. And we could spot them a long way off and then cut the engines. So we just kind of sat there and it was absolutely spectacular. If you want to go to Alaska to see the Northern Lights, the winter time's your best time to go and, and up north. Uh, although there's no guarantee, I have a, a tour director friend, a dear friend that, uh, you know, she and, you know, one of her, you know, travel companions, they went up outside of, of Fairbanks, a place that's specifically designed uh, for the Northern Lights. And they got to see snow and cold and fog and stuff like that for their time up there and still waiting to see those Northern Lights. How about the bugs? I uh, hear there's a lot of bugs. Um, is that the case in the months that you travel? I haven't found that to be so. Okay. Um, the parts, that, I mean, if you were up there fishing and you were in the interior around some of the lakes, I could understand it, but I have never experienced, you know, problems with, with bugs up there. And uh, when you're on the ship, there are none. And in those ports, you know, there are none mm -hmm. that, that I've experienced at least. Do people um, go on their own into Denali with a car rental or is it mostly by tour? It's mostly by tour. You're only allowed to go you know, uh, I think it's about 20 miles, might be, might not even be 20 miles. And there, there is a park ranger, uh, you know, at a checkpoint and private vehicles are not permitted in. Now, with that said, I believe it's September after the season is over towards the end of September, might be the first part of October. There are, I believe, two weekends where the park service will allow private vehicles in, but it's on a lottery basis because they only allow just a few vehicles to go in and quite competitive to try to get one of those spots. Uh, you'd have to book your, you know, I'm not sure how far in and out they let you know who has uh, been awarded with that, but you know, you then have to get yourself up there and do that. Sure. And it's, to, 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 you know, Denali is beautiful. I mean, they've tried to keep it, you know, in this beautiful pristine condition. You know, they, they don't interfere with the animals. You know, we had the picture of both the bears and the caribou, you know, on the roadway the bus stops, you know, you're not allowed. I mean, 
those two bears. That was a mama and her cub. And it was cute. And my group was absolutely loving it. And I'm just looking at, at the time because I had to have my group down in Wasilla for dinner and we're having salmon that night. And I want them to enjoy fresh salmon. And these bears, they're just taking their good old time like there was nobody behind them. And, you know, we couldn't, you know, get up or blow the horn or anything else. We just have to show them that it's their park. You know, we're just visitors there. Right. There was a photo, I believe it was you, with the whale in the background photo bombing, right? What type of whale was that? And how close was it to you? Wasn't that you in the photo? Uh, yes, that was me yeah. in the photo. Uh, but I have to admit, um, I was in I was in Juneau, and that's a beautiful uh, little park. It's brand new. It's just a, a couple years old. I think it opened in 2019, and that is Taku, T-A-K-U, uh, the Taku statue, and um, it, it's on a timer when the water comes up, and it actually makes it look like, you know, Taku has breached, and so, you know, I spent half my day, you know, in Juneau trying to take that selfie of, uh, or trying to get somebody to take a picture of me with the, uh, with the whale, um, so I could mess with folks. That's so. funny. Okay, here's a couple of questions about um, your favorite things. And I'll, I'll combine these because I think it's gonna be hard. If you only had one place to visit, I think I know the answer to this one. In Alaska, where would you go? But let's, let's say after that, uh, what would be your top three things to do in Alaska? So where's your top place you like to visit? And then what top three three excursions, adventures, would you recommend? Wow, that is, that is so, so hard. Uh, yeah. I mean, I love the Tundra Wilderness Tour uh, because it's constantly changing. Uh, I, I do it every single time I go up there. Um, it's seven to eight hours, you know, on that school bus and, you know, you're bouncing around. But again, I still remember when we came upon that wolf and, and just the feeling that just overwhelms you. I mean, you know, I wear a strap around my neck so I don't drop my camera when I see things like that. Um, but, you know, there are so many different things up there. Uh, the two bears, um, and, you know, at the end, that was a mom and the cub. And we were with them for probably almost 45 minutes. When we first came upon them. They were on the, the side of the road. And um, there's a little, you know, animal up there called the uh, Arctic ground squirrel. And it's like chicken nuggets to a bear. And they spotted one. And the mama went over to the burrow and in just about three swipes with those enormous, powerful paws, she was down there and, you know, had her little snack. And, and you see little junior there like, hey, mom, how about me? And mom say, hey, get your own. You know, uh, you got paws, use them. But I mean, you know, it's just moments like that, uh, you know, spotting, you know, the mom and the cubs. We were there one day and we're coming down and other buses are just zooming by you know, this mom and two cubs and the mom lays down and starts to nurse these two cubs. I mean, you can go to Denali hundreds of times and you may not ever see that or anything close to it, but, and I will probably never see it again, but just the, the, the constant changing Denali, the beauty of polychrome, of uh, the Toklat River, of whether you're gonna see the mountain or not, how will you see the mountain? Uh, it's just spectacular. Um, I love whale watching. Uh, you never know what you're going to see. And when those orcas appeared, I mean, again, if I hadn't had the cameras around my neck strap, you know, you know, it was lucky I didn't end up in the water. Uh, you know, I was just so excited. And I mean, it was just, you know, so much fun. Um, there are my two favorite things to do. I mean, in, in Skagway, I love, you know, going out and hiking around some of those falls and places. I mean, they are also neat. Uh, you know, just wonderful places to visit. At Ketchikan, you know, I always get out, I always walk the creek. You know, I take my group, if they want to go with me, I'll show you where the falls are. I'll go up, I'll show you the spawning beds. I'll point out, you know, what's going on. You know, it's just something totally unique. Um, you know, it's just a fun, fun tour. There was a follow-up. You mentioned your camera several times on this um, answer. So why don't you tell us, uh, what kind of camera are you using? Is it, is it needed? that you have to use a camera with a telephoto lens? You know, are the new cell phone cameras fine? What do you find when you take people up to Alaska? Well, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a dinosaur and, and I love a camera. Uh, this is a, you know, a Canon Rebel 7, I think it is. And I have a zoom that goes, you know, I'm not sure if it's 300 or something like that. And, 
you know, I, I just play with it. And, uh, you know, I take, you know, hundreds of pictures, you know, every tour, a lot of my discard. And then, you know, it, it's just something I like to do. And then I share them with some of my guests. And, and then I encourage my guests to share the photos they've taken either on their cameras or, or their cell phones and, uh, and trade it out because, you know, we never get the same, the, the same thing or from the same angle. Um, but it's the, the thing I encourage my people to do is when you go there first and you see it, don't immediately grab your camera and put it up to your face. You know, take that mental picture. That'll stay with you for forever. And, uh, you know, uh, a wise, you know, guide once told me that. And so I've been, been doing that. And then, you know, I take 100 pictures. That's a really good piece of advice. I'll have to try to remember that myself. Uh, we noticed the um, Iditarod dogs have mittens on their feet. Is that a typical normal thing for dogs? Yes. Um, it used to be they only put uh, the boots on the dogs, which might have had a foot problem. And then they realized that's stupid. Why wait till a dog has a problem? Let's you know get out in front of it. And so every dog in the Iditarod, uh, you know, will have you know boots on there and you know, the, uh, the musher, he will have, you know, supplies of boots in case they wear one or throw one or something like that. And, you know, so now they protect, you know, the dog's feet and, you know, they have less and less and less uh, foot problems with the dogs. Okay. So we talked about, um, salmon, halibut, is there crab? Are there crustaceans as well? Mm. Uh, king crab. And, uh, they are delicious. Uh, two places that come to mind, uh, Tracy's Crab Shack in Juneau. Uh, the ship usually ties up. You can look at, at Tracy's. Uh, excellent. And then the other place is Icy Straight Point. Uh, they have, um, it used to be on a little pier. I think they still have a stand on the little pier, but they also have a small little snack bar restaurant type thing. And you can get uh, king crab clusters there also. And, you know, different, you can get a, a crab bisque and, you know, other things like that. But yes, very, very popular. Uh, Anchorage has some wonderful restaurants, um, you know, that I always enjoy, you know, when I'm not running back to the airport. Um, the Glacier Brew House, uh, that is my favorite. And if you go there, uh, save room for the, the bread pudding uh, at the end. It is delicious. They're halibut and bread pudding, the perfect combo. So. Okay, we will. Um, the glaciers, they seem to have a blue look to them. Is that what it really looks like when you're there? And why blue? Is it coming from the sky color or what are we seeing? Okay, where you're seeing blue, it's, that's where there's been some recent calving. Uh, the glaciers themselves will have that white, maybe even a dirty look, you know, as they are slowly um, moving along there, picking up rocks and dirt and everything else. And so sometimes I, you might have saw, seen the striations you know, in, on the face of the glacier. Uh, you know, that's what I think it's called moraine that has been collected, you know, through the, through the decades of, of the slow movement of that glacier. When there is calving and that part of the, the, the face of the glacier falls off, you know, it exposes ice. It's never been exposed or has not been exposed to light for so long. And it's so pure that the reflection, you know, you get that blue look. Uh, and, and if somebody is, you know, knows the scientific terminology for that, you know, <laughs> I, I don't, I forget what it is. So uh, somebody might chat us in a minute and give us that information. Yeah, but you know, something about the blue spectrum or on the, whatever it is, but it's, it's gorgeous. For the folks and, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, Hubbard is, um, you know, it calves quite often. Uh, I've been at uh, Mendenhall many times and I've seen large chunks uh, icebergs floating in Mendenhall Lake there, but it's rare that I've seen any calving there. Uh, but, you know, so, some of the calving at, at Hubbard is just unbelievable. Um, a couple years ago, there had been so much calving, our ship couldn't get in as close as it usually does because of all the ice in the water. Um, so just for safety reasons, we had to stay back. Um, for the folks that are thinking about fishing as an excursion, do you need a license or what do they allow for tourists and fishing? Now, um, the person that, you know, was at Icy Strait, uh, he was part of a group. They were from Pennsylvania, a lovely group, and, and the men loved to fish. And so they all bought uh, visitor fishing licenses before. Uh, you can buy them, you know, in, in Alaska you know, at, at many different locations. And then you can fish for, it's either 10 or 14 days. 
um, you know, there. If you're going out to fish, you have to space, pay some special fees for your licensing. Uh, you're out with a, you know, a licensed charter operator. Uh, you have to get, uh, if you're going for a halibut, you have to get a halibut stamp. You're not talking a lot of money, uh, but you just have to decide what you're going for and, and pay that. I have a question. Uh, I'm reading a question from one of the um, attendees, but it also applies to me. It says, how long should you stay in Denali? One of the reasons why our tour is 14 days is because we chose to stay an extra day in Denali, hoping that it increases our chances to see some good views. What do you recommend in terms of a stay in Denali? Uh, well, your standard you know, stay in Denali is one or two nights, uh, depending on you know, how you've booked your cruise. If you're booking it through the cruise lines, you know, they offer, you know, an enormous menu. If you ever looked at their website of, you know, how many nights you can spend here, there, and everywhere. Uh, two nights is, is very good, optimal, because that way you'll spend a full day going out into the park. And then there's other things to do around Denali. You can go out to a, uh, a trapper's camp and they will explain, you know, trapping. There's still people up there that make their living, you know, trapping, you know, different animals out there. Um, you know, there, there's just so many things to do. You know, up there, there's also Jeff King, um, who's one thing I did a rod multiple times. You know, his, you know, his kennel is up there and you can go out there and he's just a delight to have him explain, you know, what he's been through in his life. He, he has the uh, great distinction of being in the lead at one time. He came into one of the rest stops and fell asleep and the other mushers saw him asleep. Uh, and so they just, you know, shortened their rest and kept on going. By the time Jeff, you know, woke up, he was no longer leading the race and somebody else won. But I mean, just uh, a, a joy to listen to. And, and, you know, there's several other mushers that, again, open up their kennels and invite you to their places. And, you know, if you get that opportunity, go for it. Great. Um, there was a question that I just lost here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, back to the Iditarod dog sledding. Is it the same dogs that go the whole distance or can you swap out? Do you know anything about that? You start with a certain number of dogs. I think it's 16. Uh, if you lose a dog, you lose a dog. Uh, and by losing your dog, if, if you have a dog that's lost its desire to run, you know, you're going to unhook them at certain checkpoints. Sometimes you might unhook them and put them in the sled and bring them in. Or if you have a dog that might have gotten you know, injured or fatigued, or uh, the dogs are checked every so many miles by a team of veterinarians to make sure that you know, um, you know, they're physically okay. And, um, you know, during the course of it, but there, no, there are no replacement dogs along the way. Um, you have your best team together and then you finish with this, with as many of those as you can. For somebody here who likes the train um, travel, how much of Alaska can you see by train? Well, the, the train goes from Seward uh, all the way up into Fairbanks. Uh, to ride that, that would be about 12 hours, um, which would be a little bit much, but you could break it up over several days. And then you have the Yukon and White Pass, which is just, you know, that's a three hour venture, you know, out of Skagway up into the Yukon, turn around and come back down. And, um, you know, it takes about three hours, but that's all you're going to see by train. There used to be, you know, some other lines, but they were never for, um, for passengers, it was for hauling, you know, coal or something along those lines. Okay, we have a question and I'm going to botch up all of the pronunciation, but um, one of the attendants says, you have me curious now, uh, Homer, Atu, Kanae, Port Barrow, and Little Diomede Island have always fascinated this person. Are they worth the great distance? And what do you see out there other than maybe Russia from your window? Well, uh, there you can, you have the little and the big diomedes. Um, uh, the big diomede is, is part of Russia. And then just a couple miles away is the little diomede. And, you know, from the one you can see the other. So uh, when uh, Sarah Palin was mentioning that, it was, you know, the Saturday Night Live gets the one that started spreading it different, but uh, you can actually see it. But uh, to go up there, I'm not even sure if there's much there other than maybe a, a weather station or something. I really don't know. Uh, but uh, I would not, I'd just get, I'd buy the picture. Uh, I'm not sure if I would, would, would venture there. You would spend you know, a lot of money because you'd probably have to charter an aircraft. I'm not sure if there's any commercial runs that would go there. Um, 
I mean, you wouldn't have a hard time finding somebody that would fly you there. There are more licensed pilots in Alaska than any state in the country uh, because, you know, there are so many remote villages that most of them are, um, you know, flying out in these small, uh, you know, seaplanes and, and landing in the, in the middle of nowhere. Um, outside of right by, you, you'll fly into Ted Stevens Airport in Anchorage. Right alongside of that is, um, I think it's Lake Hood uh, Airport, which is where all the, the seaplanes are. It's the largest seaplane base, you know, in the world, I believe it is. And it's just constant seaplanes coming and going, either taking hunters or fishermen out or taking supplies out to uh, remote places. That's good. I'm going to wrap up with one last question. And this question has to do with how you organize your trip. Um, usually people do a little bit of cruising, whether it's one week of cruise and some time on land. What do you recommend in terms of going north or south from the cruise and doing land first or second? And does it even make a difference? Um, my preference is to do the land portion first. When you get to Alaska, if you're coming from the East Coast, there's a four hour time difference. Plus with all the, um, the light up there, you know, it just messes with you a little bit. It takes a couple days to acclimate. And again, if you're, you're up early, you know, doing some of your activities, you have a certain bit of adrenaline going when you get there. You know, you tap into that adrenaline to do those, those early morning activities and, uh, you know, taking advantage of the sleep deprivation because uh, you're not sleeping right till you adjust. I wouldn't call it sleep deprivation. That's not fair. But, you know, just the change of your habits. But I would do that first. And then after a couple of days, you will be adjusted. When you get out, get on the cruise ship, I mean, you can just chill and relax. Usually that first day out of Seward, if you're going south, um, you have a sleep in. Uh, and then you want to be awake for sure for Hubbard Glacier. If you're going north, uh, you know, again, out of either Vancouver or Seattle, you're going to have a day or so at sea. Um, there, but, you know, I would find it hard to do all the relaxing stuff on the cruise ship. Um, they do feed you there, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks, and everything else, and the food is absolutely delicious. So when you get off, I mean, uh, you waddle off that, that ship, and you might not want, you know, the, uh, you know, the hiking or the little bit of walking that might be involved in some of the other things. That's awesome. Thank you. So, Bob, I just want to thank you so much for bringing your love for Alaska to everybody tonight. And I want to thank the attendees. Without you, obviously, we would not be doing these virtual tours. Um, so thank you all for being with us. And thank you, Bob. And we will see you all next week on another journey to a different destination. Thanks again.